<laughs> and uh, um, <laughs> so, and, it, and I said, oh, yeah, and it won a Smarty Award. I said, it's very, very good. Um, so, so, and I, so I, did, and I, I read the second one as well. And I remember going to a party at someone's house, um, and it was, it was like the third day of reading. Reading a, a novel takes about if you do it slowly and easily and without too much, you know, hurry and enjoying yourself and you know giving yourself time to get it right. I would say three days, t ten to five with an hour for lunch and good tea break and a good coffee break. You know, is, is you can you can you can get it done and in a way that is not too straining on your voice and you can keep refreshing it and, and it being interesting. So it was the end of the third day and I wasn't husky exactly, was just a bit, a tiny bit <clears throat> like that. And someone said, "What have you been doing?" And I said, "I've been reading." his children's story, and it's the second one actually, I said the first one was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and this one is called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and one person at the party said, oh yes, I've heard of these, they're really, I think they're quite popular. And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I said, I'm in the beginning to be. Um, there was an article someone said in a paper about these new children's stories about this, is he a wizard or something? I said, yeah, and oh, and like her parents read it to their children and then sit on the stairs reading the rest of it to themselves. And I said, yes, because they are quite Moorish, I said, they are fun. So, and, and so it slowly, like, and then when I'd done the third one, I said, oh, the Harry Potter, oh, yes. But the really amazing thing was when I was doing the fourth one, Jo Rowling herself had done a tour of America, uh, a signing tour, and, and that's, she'd just taken off there. And, they, and by this time, these were the most famous children's stories of their time, and they were about to become, perhaps, you know, she was the, the greatest literary phenomenon of, 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 of our age. And she told me about, you know, signing cues, you know, the, we've talked about the, the, the photography, but there's also the, um, you know, that people have presents for you, and they're very sweet. Anyway, she was in a shop in, a, in, in, in New York on the first one, and it was a massive line of people. And there were, you know, like 700 boys with scars on their foreheads, you know, and little goggle spectacles. And there was even a woman with a gilt frame around her, a fat woman. You know, like but, um, I mean, it's just, you get really bizarre things of that nature. But every now and again, someone in the queue would say, oh, Miss Rowling, as they would say her name wrong, usually. Um, Miss Rowling, I have this for you. And they would hand over a little envelope. And... And the, and the person from Scholastic, her publishers in America, or from her agents, uh, would grab the envelope and say, thank you, and snatch it away, and Joe would go, oh, thank you, I'll, um, yes, and sign. And this kept happening, and eventually, after hours and hours of signing, the last book was signed, and she was rubbing the callus on her finger, and she turned and she said, by the way, you were very rude to those people who had things to give me. You just snatched them away like that. It was a bit odd, I thought. It was a bit offensive. And they said, oh, no, no, Joe, Joe. Um, these people have written their own scenarios in which Hermione does this or Ron does that, this happens to Dumbledore, and they've written little plot lines, whatever, and so when your next book comes out, there will be some similarity and crossover and they will attempt to sue you. But they will not be able to sue you because your fingerprints are not in the envelope. You have never seen what they have written. We can depose before witnesses that you never saw any of this. It will be signed and sealed in a safe that you have not read it. And we will save you a lot of hassle. And that's when she thought, this is not normal for children's authors, is it? This is a new territory. This is a new area for a writer to be in. It's wonderful to be successful, but when your people have to think like that, you realize it. And sure enough, of course, dozens and dozens of lawsuits came. I gave you a story about Hermione and you used it. And she would, she would you know, they would get a letter back from a lawyer saying, in legalese, uh, f off out of my face, you mad bitch. And there you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask the audience for an S? Ooh. Sex. Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear, sex. Well, it was the first thing that was called that. I'm, I'm, it's the I'm, only thing that was yes, called that. Yes, it was that. the only <laughs> thing that was called that. <laughs> um, uh, not my natural area of expertise, though. So, uh, uh, um, I, I can cook a few courses in the banquet of love, I like to think, but um, uh, the, I don't know what that means either. Um, oh, I thought it was going to be on record that you said uh, that. Yeah, I, <laughs> Probably in your obituary. I, I'm, 
I was called up in the 80s. This, this was, I, I created a, a, a strange rod for my own back um, when in the 1980s I was called up by a, a rather marvellous man who may have played, um, um, uh, played, if that's the word, who may have appeared at Hay, called Jonathan Meads. I don't, has he, has every, I'm sure he has. Um, you may remember some of his documentaries about architecture. He usually wears sunglasses and a, and a dark suit, but he's a rather wonderful writer. But at the time, he was a features editor or similar at Tatler magazine, which was, um, I think, in those days being edited by... I was either Tina Brown or it might have been Mark Boxer. And uh, he called me up. Uh, and I was not a well-known person. I'm talking about 1985 or something like that. I, I, I don't think even Blackadder would have come out yet. But I'd, I was well-known in a small circle because I was doing a little bit of journalism, a little bit of radio. I'd done some TV comedy and things like that. And, and some, you know, the writing, I suppose, mostly. And he said, I'm, I'm commissioning some people to write an article about something they don't do. Gavin Stamp is doing something about the fact that he doesn't drive. Brian Sewell is doing something about the fact that he doesn't go on holiday. Uh, somebody else is doing something about they, they, would, they would never have a, an, a pet. Is there anything you don't do? So I thought about it. I said, gosh, I, I like to think I, I do almost everything. Well, there's sex, I suppose. I, I don't do that. Would that count? And there was a sort of pause. I said, 400 words by Thursday. Um, so I... <laughs> I, and it, it so happened, it fell out that, um, I've talked a bit about love, which is obviously the important thing, but um, I'd, 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 I'd had a partner at Cambridge and he and I had stayed together and in you know, the first year after leaving, we shared a, a flat together in, in London, but he was, he was much more interested in the, in the sexual gay world of London in the early 80s and I, I wasn't, I've always absolutely loathed um, gay bars and, and clubs and things, uh, just because I can't bear being looked at in that sort of inspect you sort of way, that raking eye that goes up and down. And I just feel so inadequate. And all I want to do is have a conversation. And I'm, I can't, certainly don't want to dance and I don't want to <laughs> grind away in some dark room. I just want to, you know, I, know, I just want to say, so which is your favourite Evening War novel? And uh, <laughs> it doesn't, does, there aren't any bars for people like me, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so, so I sort of just gave up on the whole idea of sex and, um, um, and, and was happy because I was, um, there's a, if I have a motto at the moment anyway, it is uh, a line of Noel Cowards that somebody told me about not, not long ago, which, which he apparently said to, to, um, uh, to, to Ronnie Neem, the, the film producer and director, um, he, uh, who was saying to him, gosh, you do so much, and you, you, you get the plays and the songs and the this, and you never relax, you never stop. Why is it? And he said, because work is more fun than fun. <laughs> and, and that was sort of how I felt. Work was more fun than fun. If fun was sex, I got much, a much more buzz and high and a much more lasting one. Than, in fact, they were the opposite of each other. Um, um, you know, it was slightly difficult and hard to start off the business of work and, and it took a long time, but in the long run you felt fantastic afterwards and sex is quite, quite opposite to that. Um, and so, um, you, you know, in work, I, I just found myself not having physical congress of any kind and that's what I was writing about. It had been about three years in the article. And I, I also said it is most peculiar that nature or uh, the divine being, which, whichever you choose, um, should, should somehow insist that the, the objects of desire, the prize the, the, uh, in, in sex, uh, the, the, the physical areas, should be contiguous and adjacent to the areas in which the expulsion of the most noxious poison <laughs> is also taken care of. It's as if, it's as if nature... And in the early 1993, he joined Apple, the Apple Corporation. Um, the Apple Corporation at the time was run by a man called John Scully. There was, uh, it's, it's one of the great stories of the 20th century, uh, for at least certainly for a fanatic of uh, digital things as me, but I think to any, anyone who's interested in you know, the, the influential events of our time, was that in 1984, uh, the Apple Macintosh came out. A few years earlier, in the, in the 70s, the Apple II had in, sort of invented the home computer, which had never existed, the micro. And, and the, the Steve Jobs, uh, who with Steve Wozniak founded Apple, uh, was convinced that instead of this command line with a fuzzy, you know, sort of neon -y green thing against black where you had to type everything in, what was known as a graphical user interface, with, known as WIMP, 
Windows icons, mouse pointing device, you know, uh, menus pointing device. And, and it was this thrilling world, and it arrived in the form of the Mac in 1984. And then, over a difference of opinion uh, between Steve Jobs and the board of Apple, Steve Jobs was fired from Apple in 1985. And between 1985 and 1997, he had 12 years away from Apple. In that 12 years, he founded the next computer company, on which, incidentally, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. So Steve Jobs' influence there is colossal as well. And he also founded the Pixar Animation Studios, which, of course, invented, really, in commercial terms, um, the, the possibilities of, of computer-generated uh, imagery uh, and, and animation. Not invented, he's, he's you know, a great salesman, Steve Jobs. He's a great, he sees the potential of things and he makes them ready for the market, but he's not innovated in the literal sense. He's not a, he's not a tech head. But anyway, while he's away, Apple goes, it's spinning around, it's in a terrible state. And in 93, John, Johnny Ive joins and um, is very frustrated. He's a very good designer. There's not much he can do because Apple is just getting, going from crisis to crisis. It brings out products that are, very remarkable, like the Newton and so on, but nobody buys them, nobody's interested, everybody laughs. I was a passionate Apple advocate, but I was just used to people tutting and shaking their heads and saying, well, but, and certainly by 96, everyone was saying, and were convinced, Apple would no longer exist. It simply would not exist. There wasn't a market for it. It was something like 1% of all computers sold in the world were Apple Macs, and, and, and it just was not profitable. They had not made a profit on a line of computers for a long time. The inventory was piling up. The stock price was on the floor. There was no hope for it. Um, and it, it was so bad that um, everybody kind of, as I say, washed their hands of it and gave up. And they were so desperate at Apple, they actually invited it was kind of confusing. They wanted to buy Next because it had some software stuff that was very useful for them, some operating system software. So in buying Next, they brought back Steve Jobs and they had no one else to lead the company. He said, do you want to lead the company again? He said, well, I can't really because I'm, I'm the boss of Pixar uh, and you can't be the CEO of two companies. And they said, well, uh, well, we'll buy Pixar as well. Oh, no, I tell you what, sell Pixar. So he sold Pixar to Disney for a gigantic sum of money and Disney shares, Steve Jobs instantly became the biggest single shareholder in the Disney Corporation in that deal, bigger even than Roy Disney, Walt Disney's nephew. And he was able to go to Apple on a salary of a dollar a year plus a stock option. I'm coming to Jonathan Ive, I know this will bore you all because it's computers and we're in a literary festival, but it is so fascinating as a human drama. Um, he looked around this company that he had founded and it was in desperate trouble. Nobody could, would give it the time of day. And he saw this young British designer and saw some of his work. And he picked up the phone and said, come up to my office. And Johnny Ive, who had had a desperate time with all his ideas being rejected and not really getting anywhere, had writ wrote out a letter of resignation and put it in the back pocket of his trousers and went up to the office, all prepared to be fired, and said, no, before you fire me, I'm resigning. And Steve Jobs said, I've had a look at some of the things you're doing. I think they're very exciting. Whatever you need, it's yours. Go away and come back with something exciting and new and different that will make people happy. And Johnny Ive designed this extraordinary one-piece machine called the iMac um, in transparent plastic, Bondi blue coloring. It was really remarkable. And it was the first computer that Apple made a profit on. It had done for 12 years. And then he invented this, designed, it was not an invention, uh, but an MP3 player of such simplicity and beauty and pleasure to use that it utterly transformed the music market. And it was called the iPod. And then he designed a, t a phone. Here it is. Ah! Um, and then oh, it's backstage, a pad. <laughs> um, he, is, he had to wrestle it off him. Yeah. <laughs> He is so talented and so charming and so modest and so extraordinary. It is remarkable to me that he hasn't been knighted, uh, not because he would like a knighthood, but because it would recognize that designers are at the very heart of our culture and our, our society and our world. They alter the way we look at things and do things. He's as aware as you are and I am that not all technology is perfect. It doesn't mean that a thing is universally and unequivocally good. There are complexities and ambiguities about what the digital age is doing to us as a society, as a community, as individuals. But 
You could not be prouder of any Briton, I don't think, than Johnny Ive. He's worshipped in Europe and in America as the greatest industrial consumer de industrial designer of our age. But only a few hands went up when I said his name, and that's sad to me because I think he's a great man. No, thank you. Knighthood. <laughs> uh, since you brought it up, what, why have you not been knighted, and oh, uh, would you approve of the system? I, oh Lord, I, um, uh, <laughs> um, if, I, if, if, if I was married to a lady, I might have a lot of problems, mightn't I, with, um, with them saying, "Oh, but I want to be Lady Fry." My wife might say, "Oh, I actually have a Twitter wife, Mrs. Stephen Fry, and it's she might want to be Lady than Fry." I'd anticipated um, this conversation. It's not. It's, it, it's terribly embarrassing even to think about such things. Uh, it would be embarrassing of me to reveal that I'd been offered it and turned it down, if that were true, because that would sound snipey and ungrateful. Uh, it would be uh, embarrassing if I said, yes, I can't understand why I haven't been either. There is, there is however, a famous story uh, of a philosopher, um, a quite well-known philosopher, who was asked by one of his students. He said, uh, there, there are statues of um, Nietzsche and Spinoza, uh, but there's no statue of you. Why is that? He said, you know, um, all my life I have believed it is better for someone to ask why there is no statue of you than why there is. <laughs> and uh, it's it, a lot better to, uh, for someone to say, why on earth did, haven't they knighted you, than to say, why did they knight you? <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy being Mr. Stephen Fry, thank you. But, but it's very charming that you might, you might ask us such a thing. Um, I, I knew Francis Bacon slightly, which was a great honor, the, the painter. and, and um, uh, I stole the story he told me uh, in, in, in the hippopotamus and gave it to uh, uh, as an occurrence that happened to a character. But he, he was, um, uh, I was born in Ireland, of course. But but he had some, he had a knighthood. Uh, there was an honorary one, and like Bob Geldof, I can't quite remember. But he was there, and there was a sort of rather, he said, cliché sort of alderman from Bradford. Uh, when they were sort of lining up and being instructed by Aquarius and Chamberlains and various things as to what they were to do. And he said, so um, what are you in for? And Francis said, well, I'm, um, they're giving me a, a, a knighthood. Oh, oh yeah, because this, this fellow was getting an MBE or something. And he said, oh, yeah, um, uh, what's it for? He said, well, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a painter. Oh, you're not one of them modern artists, are you? To which Francis not unnaturally said, no, I was born in 1428. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. Of course, I'm a modern artist. What are you? It's a just ridiculous question. Anyway, this this very pompous figure. Um, so.